Safety precautions were taken during the making of this video to minimize the risk of COVID-19 transmissions among volunteers and staff involved in this project. Please note that the primary presenter may be unmasked. This allows the speaker's voice to be more clearly heard and understood. All others involved in this production and in proximity are masked and taking all necessary precautions. All tools being presented have been sanitized for the safety of the presentation and team. During this presentation, brand names of products may be visible or mentioned. This is in no way an endorsement of any merchandise. The products shown and the discussions surrounding them are for the informational purposes only and not to be construed in a positive or negative context. Hello and welcome to the Williamsburg Botanical Garden. This wonderful environment is managed and maintained by a diverse group of volunteers who care deeply for the plants, the trees, and the beautiful grounds that support a multitude of nature's beautiful species. We are so fortunate to be able to use this special location in this video that will follow to show you all of our beautiful pruning way. Hi, my name is Harry Fall. I have been a master gardener for about three years. Uh, this year, I've been asked to take the lead on our pruning clinic project. Unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, we're not allowed to go to people's houses and teach them hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face how to do pruning. So we've elected as a team, all the people you've met, uh, as a team to produce three videos. And I'm proud to be part of that team and I'm proud to be working with the Master Gardeners out here. My primary uh, thing we're going to be talking about today is tools. And what would be more fun than sitting at home thinking about pruning tools? What are you going to do when it comes to that season when it's time to prune? Well, we're going to talk about all of that today. We're going to really have a bit of a, a good time talking about all the different tools that you can buy for your family, as friends, by, uh, to your husband, to your wife, so you can get them out in the yard and get them working alongside of you and doing it properly and safely. But, but speaking of safely, that's where I want to start. Nothing happens that without it being safe for your benefit and your family's benefit. So let's just talk about a couple of things that we're going to start with. And that's safety glasses. I cannot stress the importance of these. Time and again, when you're reaching into a shrub, into a, a heavily branched tree, time and again, those little nasty little things are going to reach out for you and they're going to want to poke you right in the eye. They, they're, they're really vindictive, these branches. I just have to say that. So safety glasses are a must. If you're working overhead with a pole pruner, I can't stress this again. It's so important. Pole pruners create widows and widowers. They truly do. This right here is so important. Now, if you're going to work with chainsaws or other power equipment, these. I suffer from high frequency hearing loss because I was a chainsaw professional for many, many years. It destroyed my hearing because I didn't have this. Please don't suffer what I'm suffering right now with high frequency hearing loss by not protecting your hearing. When you go out in the garden, you think that you're covered by leaves and the shade and so forth. Chances are you're going to be in and out of the sun time and time again. Please, please, please put on sunscreen. Melanoma and the other skin cancers are just too dangerous and they're too prevalent in today's world. Please use a good brand of sunscreen. And while you're out there, also use a, um, a, a mosquito repellent, tick repellent product. Time and again, I've picked up some ticks when I'm working out in the garden. This does repel them. Ticks carry a whole bunch of different diseases. I highly suggest that you get a good, de or a very decent uh, tick and uh, mosquito repellent, a bug repellent. Please use that. Going further into the safety issue, gloves. You can see these aren't exactly new. These are well worn, but I go through a pair of gloves about every two months. And um, please wear a good glove to protect your hands. It's not just from cuts from your tools. It's from branches pinching. It's from a you grabbing a branch that has thorns in it you didn't realize. It protects you all the way across the board. Good pair of leather gloves or something similar. Boots. No, I'm not going to take off my boots and show one to you. I got too big of a foot. Don't go out in sandals. Don't go out in open-toed shoes. My Lord, please put on a good pair of stout shoes. So please, a good solid pair of boots. You can't go wrong with that. And lastly, long sleeves. Uh, I wish I could show you some of the scratches and scars and so forth I've had from not listening to my own advice. Please, please, please wear long sleeves when you're out there. So now, before I bring the first tool forward, what I have to say, people ask me all the time, Harry, you've been pruning for decades. 
why do you get into this? And I said, you know what it is? It's per personal gratification, instant gratification. I can look at something that needs work, pruning work, trimming work, thinning work, and I look at how perhaps mismanaged a tree has allowed itself to become. I can help that tree become, or that shrub become the most beautiful uh, that it can possibly be. And I look at that before in my mind, and I look at it the after in my, uh, after the, at the actual product, and I have instant gratification. You know what, that's kind of a nice feeling sometimes. So let's get into some of the tools. We're going to start with the most basic of pruners, and one that everybody should have in their kit. This is what they call a bypass pruner. This is a, uh, what's called a Felco number two, one of the most commonly used pruners by professionals. Uh, it's extraordinarily strong. It has a good steel in the blade to keep it nice and sharp. And this brand does make a number of different sizes and types to fit your hand. So one of the first things you want to do when you go looking for a pruner is if you have a tiny little hand, you may not want this particular size. When you have a hand like mine, it works out very well. The bypass pruner is aptly named simply because one blade passes the other. It bypasses it, very much like a scissors in your house. And this gives you a nice, clean cut. Now, going further with that, by the way, this is the most often used, as I mentioned earlier, pruner, pruner there is. One other thing that, really, that you really have to watch is, and when you buy a tool, is to make sure that you can get your locking mechanism right here that's easily reached. Because if you have to take two hands, let me get rid of this for a moment, and one hand do this and the other hand do this, you're just wasting, number one, a whole bunch of time and it becomes very inconvenient and tiring. So what you want is to be able to take this pruner, and I'm holding it backwards, and with one hand lock it, and with one hand unlock it. So you're going to check yourself for size on this pruner, and you're going to check yourself for the ability to reach that locking mechanism on this pruner. And another thing for those that really plan on doing a lot, a lot of pruning, I would take a good look at one that has replaceable blades. This one has replaceable blades. If you're going to use it once or twice a year, do you need that? Uh-uh. No. You can keep that blade sharp. But I've, I couldn't tell you how many times I've hit a nail. One time I even hit a horseshoe inside of a tree and a piece of wire. And, um, you know, you're going to damage that blade. So that's what I have on the bypass pruner. When you go to buy a pruner, if you have to go out and buy a new one or your first one, I'm going to encourage you to spend the extra $10 or so and get a sheath, one that hooks on your belt, one it always keeps your pruner at hand. So many times I've worked with people and I see them make a cut, they drop their pruner on the ground. Then they gotta bend as they move a branch. Then they gotta bend all the way over, pick that pruner up and make another cut. They drop it on the ground. One person said, well, I have my kit with me. Do you put this in your kit after every cut? No, have this on your belt and after every cut, you, when you're done making those cuts, you drop it into your sheath and that way it's always right at hand. Years ago, years ago, uh, you'll notice, by the way, I have two of these, exactly the same. I dropped one in a pile of refuse. I looked for hours and could not find it. I found it about four months later, and I still have it. It's either this one or the other one. They're both identical. That shows the quality of the tool after laying outside for four months. And so it cost me another $50 to buy another one of these so I could continue pruning with a quality tool. So if I would have had this sheath, hey, guess what? I wouldn't have lost it. So there you go. Make sure you get a sheath with this. Now, we're going to take this pruner, and what we're going to do is make a cut. So there's your branch. It's coming out. And there's two ways that you're going to make cuts, and it's going to be dictated by how close you're cutting to that main stem of the tree. One, with your cutting blade up, and you come, and you get it solidly back in to the blade, into the branch, I mean, a branch solidly back into the blade, and just a nice easy squeeze and cut. And of course, sometimes you want your cutting edge closest to the tree trunk, and you might want to have to turn, depending on each individual cut, you might want to turn this upside down and make your cut. What we're going to do is just talk a little bit about the quality of a tool. The first one is the one I've been showing you. That's my, uh, the tool I use primarily. And this is one that I bought at one of the uh, stores. It's a $15 tool versus a $50 tool. And I'm encouraging you to spend as much money as, as, as possible on your pruning tools because it's going to save you a lot of effort as you go forward and uh, just a whole bunch of heartache. 
And you're also, if you buy a cheap tool, you're going to be replacing it real soon. Now, take a look at the thickness of this metal right here. Take a look at the thickness on this one. This is, has bimetal, two layers. This is not going to flex. When you go into a heavy branch or heart, especially in dead wood, which is very difficult to cut, uh, as this bypass blade goes past the fixed portion, that fixed portion is going to flex out. And you're, or it can flex out. I'm not saying it's going to. It can flex out. And you're going to tear your bark, something that you do not want to do. With this one, there's absolutely no flex. You're going to get a nice, clean cut. Is this a bit more expensive? Yes. Will it last you a lifetime? Yes. This is another uh, type of pruner. It's called an anvil type. Notice that this is a flat edge, and the cutting edge closes right up against that flat edge. It does not pass by it. This is called an anvil type pruner, and you can crush the wood a little easier with this, so it's not really the best pruner when you're making fine pruning cuts. This pruner would be used primarily in dead wood. You can get a considerable amount of force with an anvil pruner, and it, uh, much more than you can with a bypass. So when you're in hard, difficult to cut dead wood, an anvil pruner is where you want to be. Another type of pruner that we're dealing with uh, is it would be a floral snip or a small limb uh, snip. You can see straight edges, just like a scissors, one blade passes beyond the other. They are used for, if you're going to go in and make small heading back cuts alongside of your nodes, you'll clip that. You don't need the larger pruners like I had. Actually, they're going to be difficult to use when you're working in a very uh, tight shrub. So we can clip with this all the way up to something around this size, and we're just going to take that right there. And this is a perfect thing for it. Now, this particular one has a serrated edge on there. That serrated edge uh, forces your cut wood away from the blades so that it doesn't get clogged up in there. It's a small detail, but it's a very uh, positive thing to have on that. One of the last tools I'm going to introduce to you is a pruning knife. Pruning knives are used to clean up rough cuts when you make a cut. Sometimes a saw, uh, when you're sawing through a limb, it will leave rough cuts around the edges. Sometimes your lopper will, sometimes your pruning tool will. So you want to take this, this or an extremely sharp wood chisel works, and you see the rough edges, the, what I have here? And you're just going to take that, and you're going to take your pruning knife, and you're going to clean it up. That's what you will be able to do. And why do you want to do that? Because when you have rough edges like this, that's a certain place where insects or disease or excessive moisture can enter and rot. We move on to the next stage in pruning tools. We started with the hand pruner, which is good for half, five-eighths of an inch. Half is generally about the most where you want to get. But now we're into a branch that's coming up on an inch thick. You don't need the huge, heavy lopper for a branch that's an inch thick. You'll kill yourself all working with it all day. Here we have a medium-sized lopper. It's a bypass tool, as just like my first printer was. And we're going to go through this, and it's going to be just a nice, easy cut. And we'll make one more on this. The perfect size tool for this particular size branch. Please do not get into these big loppers if this is the only type of branch that you're going to be into. We're going to move on to a larger pruner. This is, you can see the size of this thing. It's heavy. It can become unwieldy when you're working with it overhead, but sometimes you simply have to have a larger pruner depending on what you're working with. Now this particular one is again is a bypass where one blade passes in front of the other. This has a rubber cushion in here so when your hands come together you're not banging metal on metal jarring your bones. This one also has something that's kind of nice if you're reaching up overhead which I don't ever really really want you to do but sometimes you simply have to. It has extended handles. We're going to make a cut right through this, and you can get a lot of force. Now, this is a big limb, but look at that. It's split it, and a little bit. So I would take my pruning knife, and I would trim that back. Now, the anvil pruner, you can generally apply a lot more force to, and this is what you generally will use this for dead wood, not for live wood. So we're going to take this, and we're going to make another cut with the anvil pruner. But you see, look at what it did here. We just made this cut with the anvil pruner, but look what happened. Now, if this was in dead wood, it wouldn't make any difference, but if you were pruning something that's live, we caused some pretty severe damage right here. It actually stripped the bark right off of that limb. The bark's actually still hanging on this end of the pruner. 
So this is the last thing that you want when you're making, um, want to make healthful cuts into live wood. This is why we use a bypass pruner when the wood is live. This is another style of bypass pruner. Uh, it's got a massive blade and a massive uh, fixed portion. Look how wide it opens. So you can go up to two inches plus with this. And when you, your branch will hook in here. You notice the other bypass pruner didn't have that hook. It just had two, a curved edge. So you get your branch hooked in here and you make your cut. This is used for anything up to as big as you could fit in that opening. Pure and simple. This is a powerful pruner. Take a look at this. Not only do you have this hook on here that I just described and the bypass pruner, but you have gears that actually mesh. This increases the mechanical advantage of this tool considerably. So you're not going to have to work it quite so hard by pushing uh, on your, your, your two handles together because this gives you a mechanical advantage. And I'm going to open it. See how those gears just mesh together? But we're going to demonstrate this powerful pruner. Now, but I do want to point one thing out first. Because you have the hook, you have to open this up much wider to get your branch in than with a conventional bypass pruner. So that's a disadvantage. And you notice the, head and, uh, the angle of the handles. So your arms are spread much wider. That's the disadvantage to this. You have to get it behind that hook, and your hands are going to be much wider spread. But let's put it on here. And I'm going to get it all the way back in. And we're going to make one cut. And it just goes through that so easily. And that's a tough piece of wood we're working with. All right, we're going to go into saws. Saws you generally use for something that's uh, too large for your loppers or in tight areas. Those are the two real reasons that you have a saw. The two most, the most popular types of saws are folding saws, such as this one, and they come in a variety of sizes. I have two, and if I'm getting into a larger limb, I have this one. But when we get into like caning plants, uh, other things that are very tight, you're not going to be able to get this into that area. So the smaller saw is what you're going to be utilizing. These saws cut on the backstroke, meaning when you draw the saw back is when it's making its cut. Understand it doesn't cut on a four-stroke like a carpenter saw. It cuts on the backstroke. Always get one that has a locking mechanism to fold. Very important. There's some out there that use wing nuts. They're wooden handle, and they use a nut here that you just tighten. Those things can close on you and really cause some pretty severe damage. So these you cannot close by accident. Now, people ask me all the time, what do you do about keeping them sharp? These saws, if you just use them and you don't hit anything, they're going to last years and years and years. Uh, I only ever had one saw, and again, I hit a piece of wire that had grown into the tree, and it ripped the teeth right off the, that, you know, the edges right off the teeth. I just chucked the saw and spent another $20 and got a new small one. Uh, don't even bother trying to get them sharpened. It's not worth it. So your locking mechanism saws, key, a very key addition to your pruning tool toolbox. The bow saw. This is one of two versions. There's another version that has a wider area at the other end as well. Uh, I'll be real honest with you. If you're getting into cutting something that requires a bow saw, something that's that size, don't do it. Don't do it. Hire a professional. These are used when you're getting into uh, felling trees, real large limbs, things that can cause damage to you, even death. So please, if you're getting into something that large that's going to require a bow saw, I encourage you, I truly encourage you not to do the job. Hire somebody. Now I'm going to show you another type of saw. This is an older type that was used very often in pruning years ago. It's a double-edged saw. One side has very coarse teeth, one side has very uh, small teeth. And you know, yeah, boy, it really seems nice that you can just, if you're in a large limb, flip it over. When you get to the smaller branches, flip it over. But what happens when there's other limbs close by and you reach in to make a cut on this limb and there's another limb right here guess what you probably have damaged it and you might not have wanted to damage that so now you open that limb up for again for disease uh, or insects or something don't use this saw if you have it get rid of it buy yourself a decent folding saw another type of saw and this is not something that you're going to be holding in your hand you can see it's in a, something that's going to attach to what we call a pole pruner now I'm just talking about the saw attachment at this point for the pole pruner. I have two of them here. This one's extremely aggressive, but it has a hook on the end, which when you're working 8, 10, 12 feet above your head and you're moving this saw back and forth, it's so easy to slip out of your saw cut, and this minimizes that. It grabs onto the branch before you can slip out. 
The other one does not have that hook. Uh, any other videos that you've seen that we do, I'm using this one simply because I bent some teeth on this and it's bad and I just haven't replaced it. But nonetheless, one with a hook, one without. They're both for pole pruners. So I'm going to attach one to a pole pruner. A pole pruner is something that you're going to work overhead. Now what do you want to do when you work overhead? Glass safety glasses, a helmet. These are really important boots because limbs are going to drop. I don't like the average homeowner to be using a pole pruner. These are also called widow makers, as they have damaged and injured and aided killed people by falling limbs. Please, if you get to where you need a pole pruner, invest in a professional rather than this piece of equipment. But a pole pruner, you can see what it has right here. You pull on this cord, and that closes that blade over the fixed area and lops off the branch. Now you can reach up and make that saw cut. Now this particular pole pruner, you can, we can go up over 12 feet with. So 12 feet plus my 6 feet, you know, we can reach up 18 feet with this pole pruner. And while I'm talking about the pole pruner, I just want to address a couple of things. One, this particular one has a fiberglass lower handle, but the upper parts are aluminum. Make sure you're not working around power lines. Please, working around power lines, that's so important. These uh, extend out, as you can see right here, and they lock into the next location, and it just keep, continues to go up. So the other thing I like about this particular pole pruner is the handle is oval. It's not round. Previous pole pruner I had, the handle was round. And so when you get up there, because it's round, it was flexing a lot. This one is oval. It doesn't flex nearly as much. You're not expending nearly the amount of energy in making that cut as you do with a round handle pole pruner. So we're, we're, you know, we'll see this in demonstration through uh, one or two of our videos that we're shooting. But that's the pole pruner. Again, I don't encourage homeowners to use these. But if you have to, safety equipment and buy a saw blade that has the hook on the end. You'll save yourself a lot of effort. Another area of pruning is hedges. Hedges and shrubs that require proper pruning cuts. You're not going to go in looking to make heading back cuts. You're not going to go in looking to make thinning cuts. What you're just trying to do is properly shape your hedge. So we'll just use hedge as an example on this. These are pruning shears and they act just like a scissors. You're going to go ahead and cut something in your kitchen. You're going to use it just like a scissors except this takes two hands. Now I have two different sizes here. This one's much heavier than this. And But something I want to point out on a small one, and this is all most people need unless you have 200 feet of hedge that has large stems in it. This one has, again, the gear mesh that makes it easier to make the cut. But let me ask a question. You're in thin stemmed product when you're cutting your hedge. You're not cutting half inch thick branches. Is it really necessary to have this gear mechanism in there? Absolutely not. What it does, it makes you open your arms out further to make the cut because of that gear action. This was something I considered just a consumer, uh, just entice a consumer to buy this product. It is not necessary in a small uh, hedge pruner such as this. Let's go to the other one. This one, much larger, no mechanism. It just has one single pivot point, and you don't you don't have to open it up. And you can, but look at the width you can open up. But most of your cuts are going to be right here, and this does have the rubber bumper between here and. When you look for any type of hedge clipper, make sure it has a rubber bumper in here. This particular one just has a little rubber knob on it. This one has a rubber cushion between two metal washers. So this is designed for a lot of use. Uh, you, this will go on for years and years for you. So the reason you want that bumper in there is because every time you close this, this is hitting. And if you didn't have that, if you can imagine hitting metal on metal on metal on metal, not going to be any fun. So this gives you a nice cushion. You can actually see it flex. And you're going to be making your cuts with that. So this also, by the way, this particular one also has extended handles on it. This is a nice tool if you have a 100 foot of hedge that you're going to be trimming several times a year, uh, something like that. Or you need to reach higher if you're going to be pruning uh, ornamentals that require just external pruning mechanism. Very good tool. The gear, this is a very good tool, it's much lighter, again, very easy to handle, but I think the gear meshing mechanism isn't necessary. You know, years ago, I, one of the businesses I was in was in a chainsaw business, 
And at one time I owned 11 chainsaws. I used to do wood carving, I used to do speed cutting, which means you race through three cuts through a log, and I did this all the way across the northeastern United States and middle Atlantic states. Because I don't use this very often, I have brought myself down to a reasonable saw that's electric. It's battery powered. Uh, this chainsaw here, it will cut, I couldn't tell you how often. Bill and I, we've worked with this for an hour, I think, and we just kept on cutting before my battery went down. And because I have other batteries from this company, I just interchange it, and it's very simple. And there you go. Now, what I do want to talk about with chainsaws, though, is safety. This is the most deadly tool you'll ever have in your workshop, whether it be outside or inside. Um, more people are injured with this, more people are killed with chainsaws than anything else in a pruning industry. It's extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, both, uh, my compatriot over here, he's a, a former surgeon, and he will tell you, uh, given the opportunity, how many times he's seen saws come up and damage somebody right between the eyes into the forehead and so forth. Please, if you have to get into a chainsaw again, I'm suggesting, highly suggesting you hire a professional. Now, when you're into chainsaws, something i got to mention, whether it's a gasoline chainsaw, whether it's an electric chainsaw, please use a good bar and chain oil, not motor oil. Some people I've seen over the years, they use motor oil, or they, I've even seen people use drain oil from when they change the oil in their cars and trucks. Oh, it's terrible, but why bar and chain oil? And what's the purpose of oil? purpose of oil is to lubricate down here, when you're going through a piece of wood, you got a tremendous amount of pressure and heat buildup along this edge of your blade. Remember, this chain's turning around at several thousand times a minute. You're generating a whole bunch of heat. Can you imagine just dumping a handful of dirt down there as you're going through? That's what happens when you use drain oil. Motor oil, okay, in motor oil, 80 to 90 percent of your oil will spin off on that top 45 degree right here. It just spins off into there. So what are you getting down in here? 15 to 25 percent of your oil, and this is where you want it. Bar and chain oil has a solvent in it, or chemical in it, it's called molybdenum disulfate. It's a sticking agent. So instead of 15 to 25 percent remaining, only 15 to 25 percent is spun off, and the balance of it is brought down into your cutting edge. Please use a bar and chain oil. This is another pruning tool. This particular one is a chainsaw on the end of a pole. Now, I have several extensions for this, so I brought it in for this demonstration with the shortest extension on the end. Once again, it's battery powered. Once again, it uses bar and chain oil, but it... And now you can make your cut that you can reach. Once again, extraordinarily dangerous tool. Please, I encourage you to hire a professional if you get into this sort of thing. The next step up in hedge clipping, we went from the shears. Well, let's go to a powered hedge clipper. This is an extraordinarily powerful machine, very heavy, it's gasoline powered. You can also get them in electric, mind you. But if you're trimming, once again, uh, 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet of hedge, you're not going to want to use the hand shears that we just spoke about. You're going to want to get into something like this. And because now, you, if you're, especially if you're pruning a flat top hedge, or which we shouldn't be doing, uh, an angle top hedge, you can get a nice straight cut with this and it moves through very fast and it will go through things up to a half an inch thick. But again, if you're at this level of pruning, you're well beyond your typical homeowner. But they do make electric products like this that are very good for the homeowner. No need to go to the gasoline engine, which requires ongoing maintenance throughout the years. We're really starting to get into some detailed pruning now. Uh, we're talking about root pruning. Root pruning is where you cut back the root structure of a plant you want to transplant. And there are certain techniques, I'm not going to go into those techniques on this video, that you must use to get effective root pruning. But it's something that almost every nursery does a year or so prior to them digging up that tree that they have in its natural environment in the ground. They root prune it. There's other reasons we won't get into that. But this is a standard flat shovel. Be used anywhere. The difference with my flat shovel than most of them, this has a razor edge on it. And it's just because I put the razor edge on it. So when I go into the ground, and I do a root prune in the ground, because root pruning, you're going to put your shovel in, and you're going to cut those roots. And you want a sharp edge down here. Now, there are specific tools for root pruning that a professional uses. Please don't invest in something like that. A tip, that's the only thing you could use it for. A flat shovel with a sharp edge is all you need. Also, don't take a shovel that has a rounded bottom on them. 
because if you do that and you go into the ground to cut that root, it's going to slip off and you're going to damage more roots than what you're going to sever. Please, just a standard old flat shovel like this with a very sharp edge. Is this a pruning tool? Most people are going to say, no, nah, it's not a pruning tool. Actually, this is an end-of-life pruning tool. That's how I refer to it as. So, once again, razor sharp, I could cut paper with this. And that's just how I maintain my tool. It's not rusted, not anything. But if you're going into the ground, you, and you're going to have to cut the roots to get a, a, the rest of the structure out of the ground of a tree you just took out. Some people go in with a chainsaw to cut those roots. Nothing damages the chain sharpness more than dirt, period. You're going to ruin your chainsaw chain. And now you got another $20, $30, $40 for a new chainsaw chain. No, take an axe and just sever those roots. Just be careful. We all know the safety things you have to do with an, uh, with an axe. But i got to stress one thing. Most people don't use axes very often. They sit in your garage, in your shed, underneath your deck. And this happened to me recently. Uh, my friend over here, Bill, and I were out working in the same woods here at Williamsburg, Virginia Botanical Garden. And we were doing exactly what I just described. We were cutting some stumps out. He took my axe, that I've had this axe decades, and was not, wasn't ready to make a hard swing cut. He took it and went down underneath one of the roots and pried it up, and it snapped off the handle right here. Can you imagine what that would have done if, out, if he would have been in a full-blown swing and hit that root? It would, if it hit me or hit him, or some, it was nobody else, but it would really cause damage. So what I'm encouraging you to do, first of all, protect your tool, but no matter what, sometimes that wood gets rot. So any wood handle tool, every now and then, just take some regular old linseed oil you get in the paint department at any store and wipe down your wood handle tool with linseed oil. That will minimize the chance of what Bill and I almost had happen to us, which would have been, could have been a deathly situation. So please, you know, a $6 bottle of linseed oil, you can really protect your tool and protect, possibly protect yourself. Let's talk about sharpening. We're going to get into a little bit of the maintenance here. A sharp tool is a safe tool, just like your kitchen knives. A sharp tool makes your job a lot easier. You're not forcing that cutter through the wood. You're letting the cutter go through the wood. So please keep them sharp. Now, on a bypass pruner, one side of the cutting edge is flat. There is no bevel to it like a typical knife. The other side has a bevel to it. And that bevel is just like your knife, you sharpen it the same way. So if the fact that this was dull, I would start out with either this file or a small flat file. i use this one. And you're gonna follow that bevel that's on here, try and get that same angle. And you're just gonna come up with it like this or down like that. And you're gonna put a little edge on it. Generally, all it takes after a few days of cutting is that. Then, if you want to take it down even sharper, which I do, I will take a sharpening stone. This is just, this actually was an old fish hook sharpener. It's a whetstone, but you use it dry, and it's finer than that file. So I can really take that down to a cutting edge, very sharp. And if I want to take it down even further, I have something that's diamond impregnated. This will take it down to a fine, fine edge, and you just want to swipe it back. Now, that's the bevel. People say, I've heard other people say, don't ever sharpen the back side of this. They're exactly right. But do you sometimes have to maintain the back side? Let's say you hit a nail in the wood and you get a nick in here. It's bent back. You have to take your tool and lay it flat on here. Not at an angle, not at, like on the other side, but flat. And just take it off. So that's how you sharpen a bypass tool. We'll go into the anvil pruner. The anvil pruner is just the opposite. It has a bevel on both the front of the blade and on the back of the blade. So, because it's coming up against that fixed edge. So this has a bevel on both sides and that's what you wanna do is just take a nice little edge on this using your sharpening stone or tool. Same thing goes with your loppers. It's no different. One side has the bevel and you wanna sharpen it. One side is flat, and you don't want to sharpen it, but you do want to knock off any high points. I feel a little nick right here. And so if I take this across, that little nick will just disappear, and my tool will function much smoother. And that's what we do about sharpening. But to maintain them even further, we get into discussions on what kind of 
product should I use to keep them lubricated? A lot of people say, oh, I use WD-40. I don't use WD-40. WD-40 is a really, really good product, one of the best there is. It, it, if you have moisture inside that tool and those joints, you spray the WD-40 on, it displaces the moisture. If it, 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 remo it stops the things from squeaking, it loosens up nut, rusty nuts and bolts, but it's not the best to lubricate. I use this particular oil to lubricate. So if my, to if my tools are out in the rain on the movable joints, I would spray those movable joints with WD-40 and then I'd come back and I would put some, uh, some 3-in-1 on there or another lightweight household oil to um, uh, make sure they're lubricated. Oftentimes when you're pruning, you're going to be pruning out dead wood, but more of, so oftentimes you're going to be pruning diseased wood. Disease spreads. It spreads by contact. Very often it spreads by contact. So although you're going to want to make your cut in diseased woods wood beneath the diseased area into good wood, you're still going to have whatever it's diseased from, you're still going to have it covering your cutting edge and your tool. At that point, before you make a second cut, what you want to do is disinfect your tool. So I use Lysol, just a spray can of Lysol, and this is all it takes. You don't have to sit there and saturate it and saturate it. It's not necessary. But I keep this in my toolkit with me when I'm out on a job. So if I'm into wood that I suspect is diseased, I spray between each cut. Now, something you don't want to do, no matter what tool it is, you spray it. By the way, you can use alcohol, 70, 91, or 99%. It does it very well as well. I just use the Lysol simply because it's convenient in a spray can. Clorox, any bleach, or pine saw. Pine saw and Clorox are really tremendous products used for what they're designed for. They're not designed to disinfect pruning tools. Both of them are highly corrosive. Do not, simply do not, disinfect your tools with one of these two household ingredients. They will destroy your tools. Use your pine saw for your cleaning. Use your bleach for your laundry. Do not use them for your pruning tools. You know, you, we go ahead and make cuts in the wood. And people think, oh God, I've got to protect that cut from the thing we talk about so often, the disease, the bugs, and so forth. So they run down to their hardware store. What do they come back with? They come back with pruning seal. I don't care what brand that is, they're all bad. There's only really one or two instances when you should be using these, and that's when there's a particular infestation in a certain type of tree during a certain type of year. Normally, you let the wood seal itself. Its own enzymes in there are going to seal of the live wood still remaining on the tree. So do not take one of these, and if this branch is still hanging on the tree, and do one of those numbers. Please. You just trapped moisture behind it, funguses or anything else behind it, you just trapped it in there. You didn't seal anything out, you sealed negative things in. Do not, do not, do not use this stuff. I wish they'd take it off the shelves and just let it for the professionals that know how to use it, when to use it.